We are live. All right. I'm going to go back to uh, calling the meeting to order and asking for, uh, I'm going to skip the pledge. We did the Pledge of Allegiance. People saw that, I think. And I think for the record, I, I would like to do the uh, posting city clerk's report on posting the agenda and roll call and uh, then go into the proclamation that I didn't do. So tonight's meeting agenda was posted on Wednesday, April 28th at 3.15 p.m. Um, Council Member Armendariz. Present. Council Member Bracco. Here. Council <laughs> Member Hilton. Here. Council Member Lero Munoz. Present. Council Member Marks. Here. Council Member Tovar. Here. And Mayor Blinkley. Here. Um, I guess I'll also take this opportunity to announce, I was, I was gonna save this for adjournment, but I was asked by Council Member Bracco and by Council Member Tovar, we will be adjourning tonight's meeting in memory of Donald Elvis Prieto. Long time ago, I went to elementary school with him um, and his aunt. So um, we will be adjourning in his memory. Okay, uh, the proclamation. So Ipolito, get ready. This is uh, for Building Safety Month. Whereas the city of Gilroy is committed to recognizing that our growth and strength depends on the safety and economic value of the homes, buildings, and infrastructure that serve our citizens both everyday life, it, both in everyday life and in times of natural disasters. And whereas our confidence in the structural integrity of these buildings that make up our community is achieved through the devotion of vigilant guardians, building safety and fire prevention officials, architects, engineers, builders, tradespeople, design professionals, laborers, plumbers, and others in the construction industry who work year round to ensure the safe construction of buildings. And whereas these guardians are dedicated members of the International Code Council, a nonprofit that brings together local, state, and federal officials that are experts in the built environment to create and implement the highest quality codes to protect us in the buildings where we live, learn, work, play, and whereas these modern building codes include safeguards to protect the public from natural disasters, such as wildfires, floods, and earthquakes. And whereas Building Safety Month is sponsored by the International Code Council to remind the public about the critical role these mostly unknown protectors of public safety, our local code officials who assure us of safe, sustainable, and energy efficient, habitable buildings that are essential to America's prosperity and whereas prevent, prepare, and protect building codes save, the theme for Building Safety Month 2021 encourages all Americans to raise awareness of the importance of safe and resilient construction, fire prevention, disaster mitigation, energy conservation, water safety, and the training of the next generation. Whereas each year at observance of Building Safety Month, Americans are asked to consider the commitments to improve building safety and economic investment at home and in the community, and to acknowledge the essential service provided to all of us by local and state building departments, fire prevention bureaus, and federal agencies in protecting lives and property. Now, therefore, I, Marie Blankley, Mayor of the City of Gilroy, California, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2021 as Building Safety Month and encourage citizens to join with their communities in participation of Building Safety Month activities. Phew. Okay. <laughs> Lots of words. Good oh evening, my Madam goodness. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Blankley, honorable council members. Thank you for recognizing May as Building Safety Month. As many of you know, my name is Hippolyte Olmos. I'm a building official for the city of Gilroy. Building Safety Month is a special time for the building division. It's an opportunity for us to share and educate the public on some of the most critical challenges facing development community, our global community, and our building department. Every week of May will be focused on a different topic such as water safety, energy and innovation, disaster preparedness, and training the next generation. I will briefly share two topics tonight I, as I understand your time is valuable. This week our focus is building energy and innovation. The building industry has an opportunity to make a significant contribution in reducing carbon emissions and developing energy efficient homes that are constructed of sustainable materials. Energy efficient homes consume less energy, produce fewer carbon emissions, and homes constructed of sustainable buildings materials reduce the long lasting impacts non-sustainable materials have on the environment. 
By adopting specific codes, we can do our part to reduce energy bills, improve occupant and community health, and enhance building resilience, create sustainable housing, and reduce green gas emissions. During the second week of May, our focus will be on training the next generation. We will be presenting to several classes that are part of the Construction and Energy Management Program at Cabrillo College. During this outreach, our focus will be on the importance of professional training and development. A code official needs to have strong communication skills, build relationships, and address customer service needs. We will focus on the importance of being part of the development team and becoming solution-minded individuals who guide the development community as they bring buildings to life while ensuring code compliance. Again, thank you for recognizing May as Building Safety Month. Thank you. All right. Presentations to the council. Do we have anybody wishing to make any public comment on something not on the agenda, but over which we have jurisdiction? Christina? Currently, there are no public comments. If you wish to speak, please unmute yourself um, and press nine or raise your hand. Okay. okay. All right, Youth Commission annual presentation to the council, Serena Ramirez. Welcome and thank you for being here. Hi, hi thank you. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, your audio is muffled. Boy, this is not our night, is it? Do you have any other devices on at the same time? No? Okay. Is it better or does it still sound the same? Still sounds the same. That's really weird. Um, do, I, do I call in or? Okay, yeah, um, you're not gonna be able to give your report like that unless somebody here recognizes that sound and uh, can give her a suggestion. I'll ask that she call that you call in. Yeah, that would be my suggestion. Everybody. Okay. Okay. You have the number. Yeah. Okay. So let's give you a. Go ahead. wanted to feel too much time pressure we could go on to council member reports and then come back if, if you'd like more time yeah let, let's give her a few more minutes she's on the okay yeah she's on the phone it looks like it might be working Okay, can anyone tell if she's managed to call in? I don't see her here. Okay, I, I don't want her to feel such time pressure. I'm gonna move on to council member reports and then we'll come right back. So Serena, if you're able to call in, please keep trying and then they'll just have you in the waiting. I know, but it's not showing that you're 
Do, do you see her now, anybody? She, she seems to think she's in, is she in? No, I don't see her on um, the panelists or the attendees. Okay. Okay. All right, council member reports, council member Bracco. Nothing to report, but I just wanted to send condolences to the Prieto family. Um, I, I've known Don most of my life and he'll be missed by most everybody in our community. Thank you. Council member Armendariz. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, thank you, council member Bracco for, um, for those words about, um, about uh, Donald. Um, it's hitting our community really hard. He was a, a special person. Um, let's see, um, Silicon Valley Clean Energy announced a program that could help a lot of our residents. It's called Lights On Silicon Valley. It's a grid services program where folks are eligible for a $1,250 rebate if they install a solar and a battery system and then they enroll at svcleanenergy.org slash lights on SV. Um, and uh, the Downtown Business Association, I attended, um, all I was, um, briefed about the meeting. There was some glitches with their uh, technology uh, as well. And um, we talked about a city named uh, Carmel, Indiana, that's generating a lot of excitement and a lot of interest. It's similar in size to Gilroy and its, uh, and its population and geography. Um, and they have some very really exciting things um, happening in terms of their development um, and a really um, thriving economy. So we'll be uh, watching some videos, looking into that, and actually attending a conference that they're hosting to share their uh, some of the great things that have worked for their community. That's all. Thank you. Okay, Councilmember Marks. Thank you. Yes, my deepest condolences to the Prieto family. I agree, he will be missed by all. On a happier note, uh, Gilroy Gardens is opening to premium pass holders on May eighth, and then open to the public on May twenty second. Um, Water Oasis is opening on June 23rd to premium pass holders and then to the public after that. Gilroy Gardens will only be open from Wednesday to Sunday until attendance picks up and then they'll go to a seven day a week schedule. If anyone has any questions, please go ahead and visit their website for hours and prices. I wanna give kudos to Francesca Pace from the Compassion Center and the unhoused who cleaned up the creek from Monterey Highway to the Sixth Street Bridge. Not only did they clean, but they counseled other unhoused to the importance of not dumping anything into the creek because of the damage that it does to the waterways. They recruited many of the people they spoke with and helping them in the cleanup. That kind of partnership goes a long way in finding solutions to end homelessness. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Hilton. Thank you, Mary Blankley. Um, I've just got a short update to announce that this weekend kicked off an all month long campaign for affordable housing month and bike anywhere month here in Santa Clara County, focusing around celebration, advocacy and education. And lastly, my condolences as well to the family and friends of Donald Elvis Prieto. Donald was an iconic figure in Gilroy and was known and loved by so many. Thank you. All right, Council Member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for agreeing to honor Donald tonight. I've actually been speaking with this family and they are watching tonight. So thank you for everybody who's um, said some words in regards to Donald. I quickly wanted to share what I wrote on <clears throat> one of my social, <clears throat> social media pages. We lost a great man. We, fare, um, we bid farewell to the King of Gilroy, Donald Elvis Prieto. Donald's place can never be filled and his loss will be with us forever but his memory should be treasured and his life celebrated for the amazing man he was. Donald was a great man, a great soul, a, courage, a courageous man, and a great man of Gilroy. Forever remembered, forever missed. Uh, rest in peace, my friend. Thank you. Next, uh, I want to just thank all the community residents, members of our beautiful city that are out there supporting our local businesses and restaurants. 
I had a chance to go last night downtown and walk around and it was great to see so many people there. So thank you to everybody who's out there supporting our, you know, our businesses. Much, much appreciated. Thank you. Council Member Yes. Just uh, two brief comments. One, also extending my condolences to the entire Prieto family. And uh, also wanted to take a moment and thank our uh, GUSD colleagues for joining us last week for the, uh, the joint meeting that they had with us with regard to bringing us up to speed about all that they're working through, especially in this crazy year of remote learning. Um, I, I always appreciate the work that they do on the school board, but never more so than this year. So thank you to our colleagues on that side of the, uh, on that side of the world. Appreciate it. Yes. Okay, and that brings to me, and I think we all share in the condolences for Donald, it goes without saying. So um, our heartfelt condolences to the entire family. And Melissa, my schoolmate, that was his aunt. All right, um, there's been a lot going on with Economic uh, Development Corporation, but nothing that, I don't think anything new, we're just moving along, um, we're moving along in the, uh, with Shark's Ice and moving along with the 536. And so uh, hopefully we'll have a, uh, a little more in upcoming meetings. Um, with respect, sister cities, I don't report much on that. This year, there hasn't been a whole lot going on, but they are meeting monthly virtually with um, the city of Takamachi. So other sister cities, um, not so much right now, but at least with Takamachi. How that's gonna go without the Garlic Festival, that's been the big thing that brings uh, those two cities together, uh, we'll see. Lastly, uh, on VTA, what I did wanna share with everyone is we actually got average sales tax generations by jurisdiction. So for calendar years 2018 through 2020, which cities in Santa Clara County have generated how much sales tax revenue from measure B? Because the, the ongoing fight or push at the BTA level, you know, has been making sure that measure B funds are benefiting us all and not going uh, primarily to one particular project such as BART phase two. And I think everyone might find it interesting that Gilroy is ahead in terms of sales, sales tax generation. We are more than Campbell, Morgan Hill, Los Gatos, um, the unincorporated parts of the county, Los Altos, Saratoga, Los Altos Hills, and Monte Sereno. So way out ahead at 45% is San Jose. Santa Clara is the next highest at 12%. Palo Alto is 6.5%. Sunnyvale just below six and a half percent, Mountain View at four and a half percent, Milpitas at four percent, and Gilroy at just under four percent. Then the rest are lower than that. So we certainly put our share of the money into this and why our representation regionally is so important to make sure money comes back to Gilroy. Okay, with that, I'll move on to uh, future council initiated agenda items. Are there any council members wishing to speak us to something here? I see council member Marks. Yes. I have an item that I would like placed on a foreseeable future council agenda. We need to hold property owners responsible for the maintenance and appearance of their properties. The Chamber of Commerce and Visit Gilroy have expressed concern with regards to, to first appearances and first impressions as one drives into our gateways. A statement Christina Turner, Morgan Hill City Manager, made at a recent Zoom meeting really resonated with me. She said Morgan Hill has an employee who will contact a property manager or a building owner if the building or landscaping is falling into disarray. Right now, we have some negligent property owners that need to be dealt with to help, mil to help make Gilroy presentable to all and to keep it that way. Okay. All right. So wh what are you, what's the ask? The actual ask is for us to have a discussion on making property owners responsible for their property and keeping them clean and in good repair. Because many of the gateways look bad, but not only the gateways, but other properties surrounding the cities. So that I don't know whether we talk about that with code in, about code enforcement or if we can actually have someone on the staff who would be in charge of contacting these property owners to say that they need to keep their properties up. And okay. I'm talking about graffiti. I'm talking about furniture that has been stored somewhere on their property, just thrown. I'm talking about um, garbage. It's just it's just unkept properties. Okay. Um, Council member Armendaris, you have your hand raised. 
Yeah, uh, a few questions about what will be proposed. Do you have uh, sample uh, blight ordinances or ways that this will be, folks will be held accountable that you're gonna propose? Well, I think we already have blight ordinances. I think what we need to do is make sure they start to be enforced. And if our blight or ordinances are weak, then we as a council need to tighten them up. And when it gets on the agenda, then I'll be talking about specific properties that need tending to, and, and I hope all the council comes forth with areas of concern that they have also. Um, a quick follow-up question. Mm -hmm. Do you Would you be open to um, discussing assistance for the elderly or low income who need help getting their areas cleaned up? The property owners I am thinking of that need to clean up, I don't think need economic help. These, these people have money. Yeah, they would, Can I, I'm uh, sorry, I'm going to interrupt here because I, we're, this is a future agenda request and yeah, not meant to be a discussion with, with this kind of detail. What I'm wondering, um, Council Member Marks, is are you asking for if, if the council will direct staff to come back with a report on what, what does code enforcement entail, maybe like a status report of where they've been or what they've done? Am I understanding your request correctly or are you asking for something in more detail? I would like to have a report from staff, but I want it more detailed to say, if we have all of this, we need to start doing something about it because we're not as a city. Okay. All right, so it would be a report and then a discussion from the council on what needs to, on what we would like to see. Mayor. Is that you know, and I, I agree with the council member Marks and what she's asking, but I, Councilmember Armendariz brings up a really good point. I just want to make sure that we're going to be equal and fair uh, when we start to target businesses or locations. We just need to be very careful that we're not uh, targeting folks who may not have the necessary resources to clean up their own areas. But I do agree. Those businesses that, um, that have the funds or the resources, we should target those individuals. I want us to be very careful as well. And, and in reality, anyone can pick up garbage. You don't need money to pick up garbage or paint over graffiti. Yeah, I wanna be careful. I mean, we need to decide if this is even gonna be something we want to come back, but whatever it is, it obviously has to apply to everyone the same. You don't, you, you can't tell some people they have to pick up trash and some right. don't. I mean, you know, it is what it is. So um, without being really any more specific council member, council member Marks, I, I would, uh, all I can offer is maybe what you're asking. I'm trying to help you uh, figure out what it is you're asking for, but if you think you can do a better job, then maybe say it again, but what I'm hearing is you'd like to know what code enforcement has been doing so that you can then, we can then have a discussion about what could be done differently. Is that what you're saying? I would like to target businesses and apartment complexes to keep their properties up because there are some that, that are looking shabby right now. And um, there is one, you know, there are a couple in particular that made big promises to the city of Gilroy and that they have now begun to renege. And I think these are, we need to stay on top of this, especially with more apartment complexes coming online. Okay. We don't want, you know, that, that's my thing. I'm not thinking of going after private residences. Council member Bracco. You're muted. Yeah, I think we're uh, really getting off here. This mm -hmm. isn't on the agenda. I don't believe we should be discussing it in this detail. I would uh, suggest that we ask that it be put on the agenda, staff to bring back a report on what kind of blight ordinances and stuff we have on the books right now that may be able to help. And then we can go from there if that would be mm -hmm. uh, suitable for uh, council member Marks. Mm -hmm. That's, I was trying trying to get at that. So I was trying right. to bring that in. I know you said it better than I, I did. I would help uh, you out a little. Thank you. <laughs> Jimmy, what's important is do you understand, um, are you comfortable and do you understand what that request is before we vote on whether or not to put it on the agenda? Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I, 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 we did provide you a report on the blight ordinances and the legal, legal, legal items that we have at our disposal. So I can return with a with a refresher of that. Uh, the second part is I, I think if, and I, I'm, I apologize if I'm putting words in your mouth, but I, I think it would help if I explain what code enforcement does and how they do it and at what level. 
And so that, that is that is that is that acceptable, uh, Councilmember Marks? That would be acceptable. And then when we see you know some disconnects, then we can give input to say how can this work? How can everyone work smarter? Okay. okay. And right. Harder. Okay. Not harder. Okay. Right. I'm I'm trying right. to limit the discussion on something right. we're not supposed to be discussing. Okay. <laughs> so all right. I think I think it's clear enough now for all council members to give a thumbs up if you're okay with staff bringing back the report that Jimmy described. Okay, so that looks like everybody. Okay, moving on. Uh, consent calendar. Um, is there any? Is there anything on the consent calendar that someone wishes to remove? All right, hearing none. Do I have? Uh, are there any public comments on anything on the consent calendar? I make a motion to approve. Okay. I'll second. Great. Um, Christina, can you confirm that nobody, there were no public comments? No public comments and um, nobody um, uh, is raising their hand, but if you wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand or um, star nine to unmute yourself. No okay, we have a motion. We have a motion by council member Bracco, seconded by council member LaRomagnos to approve the consent calendar. Roll call vote. Council Member Bracco? Yes. Council Member Hilton? Yes. Council Member Lero Munoz? Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. Council Member Tovar? Yes. Uh, Council Member um, Armendariz? Yes. And Mayor Blankley? Yes. Okay. Um, the Youth Commission report. Is uh, Selena online? Yes. Can you hear Selena. me better? Yes. Okay, awesome. I can hear you. Great. Very happy about that. So sorry. My audio That's okay. Fine You're not alone tonight. This has been a problem. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. Awesome. So hi, my name is Serena Ramirez and I'm the chair of the Youth Commission. Uh, 2020 to 2021 have proven to be interesting years for the commission and for our society. And I heard it's been a while since our commission has made their presentation to city council. So hopefully I can help fill you in on some of the accomplishments we've achieved and our goals for the upcoming years. So slide two, please. Thank you. Uh, here's our commission. So we have Monica Gonzalez as our advisor. Uh, me, Serena Ramirez as the chair. I'm, um, I'm in 11th grade in GECA. Augusta Schulte as our vice chair. She's in 12th grade at Christopher High School. We have James Baker in 10th grade at Gilroy High School. Alyssa Gonzalez in 11th grade at GECA. Next slide, thank you. Um, Esmeralda Garcia, um, who's in 12th grade at Christopher High School. Winston James, who's in 10th grade at Christopher High School. Meher Kamra, who's in 11th grade at GECA. Alexis Kong in 11th grade at Christopher High School. Joshua Martinez, who's in 8th grade at Brownell. Reet Pata, who's in 11th grade at GECA, and Yashila Shuresh, who's in 11th grade at Christopher High School. So moving into some of our accomplishments, we've actually started virtual youth commission meetings. It's the same, the same schedule as we once had the second Monday of every month, and it's kept the commission united and working on events. One of those events being the holiday card event, where we asked the community to create cards that they could take photos of and post with the hashtag Gilroy greetings. And it was a way to get the community involved with some virtual festivities considering the quarantine. Um, another event we have coming up is actually the virtual teen workshop. The flyer is on the screen. Um, our upcoming event on May 15th includes three workshops, vaping, mental health, and diversity and inclusion to stimulate youth awareness on these topics. This is actually the first time we'll be hosting this event. And since it's using the virtual format, the commission has been able to work on our marketing and our networking skills. And due to the current digital divide, we are learning to overcome the hurdles that come with the new online platform and access to that platform. This actually moves us, us nicely into our collaboration with the South County Youth Task Force and uh, the Morgan Hill Commission. The South County Youth Task Force agreed to help us collaborate on the virtual team workshop. And this will help our event to have wider reach while the task force supports with outreach and logistics and helps to leverage resources. And we have also recently met with the Morgan Hill Youth Commission and hope to partner on future events. This moves us into the virtual YAC socials, which have taken on the online format as well. 
and this is where we learn from other city youth councils and expand our professional network. This event has been going on for a number of years, but since it's taken on the virtual format, we've been able to attend those as well. So for the next slide, uh, this is what we hope to accomplish in the future. And we hope to make our virtual events, um, the holiday card event and the virtual teen workshop reoccurring when we commence in-person activities. And as we return to regular, regular life, we also hope to bring back in-person sessions and foster a greater sense of unity among the commission and its partners. We also hope to bring back the Pampered Princess Party. This was a highly popular event pre-pandemic and we unanimously agreed as a commission that this would be a great way to get the community involved, the community's youth involved. And of course, this would be following safety guidelines in place at that point in time. And we also, heard, we also hope to seek further collaborations with the community and its partners. So any questions, that's about it. All right, does anybody have questions for Serena? Very nicely done, thank you. Um, can you remove your screen so that I can see everybody? Okay, I see a hand raised by Council Member Armendariz. Thank you for your presentation, Serena, and for your hard work. It looks like you all are doing an excellent job and you know, kept rolling with the punches despite the, you know, the challenges um, that you face, like we're all facing with the pandemic. Um, you mentioned equity and inclusion, and I'm wondering if you all um, are working on or consider working on um, the diversification of, of members of the Youth Commission in terms of schools, because I know, because I noticed that it's heavily Gekka and Christopher, and I'm wondering if you guys have reached out to uh, students or have a plan for reaching out to students at the other high schools and um, it's 13 and up, right? So maybe high schools and middle schools at Gilroy and Mount Madonna. Yes, um, it is 13 and up. And I think we that is something that we have been considering. We haven't talked on it much, but we definitely noticed that it's a lot of Christopher High and Gekka students. And of course, we'd want everyone to come into Youth Commission. So that's definitely something I'll bring up now that you mention it. Thank you. And again, excellent, excellent work. Thank you so much. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay, yes, we get lots of applications for the Youth Commission, proud to say. There aren't usually very many. There, there are fewer applications coming from Gilroy High and uh, schools other than Christopher and Gekka. That's just the, that's who, depends, that's who applies. So council's pretty, pretty good about trying to make sure there's as much diversity as we can based on the applications we receive. Okay. Thank you, Serena, and thank you to all of the youth commissioners. Okay, we're gonna move on uh, with our agenda, moving to uh, just after the consent calendar, we're going to bits and proposals, there are none, public hearing. So item 8A, approval of the Community Development Block Grant and Housing Trust Fund Public Service Grant Allocations and Community Development Block Grant Annual Action Plan for Fiscal 2021 to 2022, so for one year. And Maria de Leon, I think you are giving the staff report, correct? Correct, thank you very much. I'm, I'll be sharing my screen right now, please. Hmm. Okay, can you see, can you hear me yes. and can you see the screen? Yes, yes to both. Yay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Uh, good evening, uh, my name is Maria de Leon and I am the program administrator for the city of Gilroy. Uh, this is our annual uh, city council presentation for funding approval for the CDBG and housing trust fund public service grant allocations for fiscal year 21 and 22. And we'll also be conducting a public hearing on the draft fiscal year 21-22 annual action plan. So each year to receive CDBG funding, 
uh, several requirements must be met. And this includes holding two public hearings per funding cycle, having a five-year consolidated plan and submitting an annual action plan. Now city staff has ensured that all these requirements have been met. Now CDBG funds can only be used to support the following efforts. So public service, Services like meal delivery, health care, youth, senior, and homeless services, and fair housing services, um, housing rehabilitation, public infrastructure improvements, economic development, uh, including uh, loans and business grants, and the removal of architectural barriers to the elderly and disabled. So this year's funding cycle included the following steps and actions illustrated on the slide from the beginning of this year to May. So staff started in January with the release of notice of funding availability, followed by a public hearing. Then HNRC received a, a funding, a program orientation and agency presentation. Then HNRC made their funding recommendations. Afterwards, a public comment period from the annual action plan took place followed by a public hearing for the plan taking place today. So with the deadline to submit the annual action plan to HUD by May 15th. So today, Gilroy is on track. So the city also made available 168,000 from the Housing Trust Fund to support annual grant requests relating to housing and the unhoused. Established in 1997, Funding from the Housing Trust Fund comes primarily from the repayment of promissory notes secured by the trust deeds recorded on property titles and equity share payments from the sale or resale of below market uh, properties in Gilroy. Staff included uh, the Housing Trust Fund dollars and the annual action plan and utilized the HNRC to make funding recommendations for public services and housing rehabilitation projects with the Housing Trust Fund and CDBG dollars. So unfortunately, the request for funding exceeded the funding amounts available. So the HNRC had the challenging job of evaluating ranking the proposals. This table is made up of two slides, it includes the HNRC funding recommendations, including the designated funding amounts. So I, I won't go over all the agencies listed in the table as they're in front of you and also included in the staff report. But um, the table illustrates uh, 439,371 in CDBG funds and 167,000 in housing trust funds totaling 607,358. The HNRC was also tasked with reviewing the progress of the agencies funded. So twice a year, the HNRC reviews the required reporting that funds the agencies uh, that they must submit. And these reports answer questions like, are they meeting all their goals? And are they using the funds in the right way? So recently council shared that they wanted updates on city funded programs. So this year we're requesting approval of one year cycles instead of two to provide city council with annual updates on the agency's progress. Staff also recommends that the City Council conduct a public hearing and receive comments on the draft for fiscal year 21 and 22 annual action plan and approve the CDBG and Housing Trust Fund public service grant allocations for fiscal year 21 and 22. The annual action plan details the use of CDBG funding for various users. So the plan includes CDBG funding for public service grants. You have it listed in front of you, housing rehab programs, and other CDBG funding, such as the Youth Center, Cherry Blossom Apartments, Monterey Gateway Senior Apartments, and also program administration for oversight, with a total investment of $607,358. The draft annual action plan was included in your agenda packet. So on April 2nd, 2021, the draft annual plan was made available on the city's website for a 30-day public review period. So comments on the draft plan were received by, needed to be received by May 2nd, 2021. I believe the city of Gilroy received a few public comments on this matter. So um, conducting the public hearing and approving the CDBG and housing trust fund recommendations will have no impact on the general fund. 
CDBG funds are allocated by HUD to the city of Gilroy on an annual basis. And this concludes my presentation and I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Additionally, we have our CDBG consultant, Paul Ashby, available to answer any CDBG related questions that I may not be able to answer, as well as other staff. Okay, thank you, Maria. Council Member LaRoman Yost, do you wanna start off the questions? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Maria, with regard to the, the Gilroy Youth Center, uh, given the fact that last year was obviously an aberration in terms of um, you know, youth being able to access some of those services, uh, how, how does the Youth Center envision using funds going forward with potentially uh, reduced access for, for youth in the uh, immediate future? Right, so even though we had the pandemic, uh, the City of Gilroy Recreation Divisions was still uh, facilitating uh, youth center activities, all with safety protocols and following county guidelines. Of course, we did not, uh, the, the youth center did not have as many children as we had before because we were limited in terms of what we were, who we were required to help. But um, we had, uh, we were full, but just a smaller number. Uh, we had, I remember seeing a setup with the tables that were apart, several feet apart. They had activities that were not, uh, that didn't have to do with a lot of interaction. Uh, but but uh, the youth center was thriving during that pandemic and still continues to be. And again, we are, they're active and uh, following guidelines, just as similar, uh, sir, to like the YMCA and other uh, after school programs that are, are taking place right now, um, following uh, county protocols and guidelines. Excellent. I'm glad to hear the youth center is still serving our, uh, our youth here in town. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Armendaris. Um, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Maria, for uh, the information. And um, I want to thank the committee too for their hard work. I remember my days on this committee, and it's not easy. It's no. really, really difficult. And I know this year was particularly challenging because of the, um, you know, it had to be done on Zoom and all that good stuff. So I wanna thank them for their work. Uh, my question is, in terms of program administration, I saw that it's a 20% of the total funds that's going to program administration. Is that a number that, um, that we can play with? Is that historically what we've charged um, as a city? Um, is it, is it allocated that way from HUD? Yes, HUD, HUD guidelines um, and stipulations say that, uh, or illustrate that the cities can apply for um, administration oversight as it is a lot of work and very time consuming. Um, and there's a lot of documentation. So you're able to ask for 20%. Okay, thank you. Uh, Maria, do you want to pull down your screen so I can see everybody who is asking? Um, I'd also like to point out that all these organizations to whom uh, this money is going have their own administration too, that they are using that money, some of that money that we're giving them to cover their administration too. So administration kind of is something that um, everybody has to, has to cover. Right. Okay, I don't see any other hands raised. I have a question. Um, it might be a silly one, but what is the difference between... CDBG non-public service and public service? So I believe uh, non-public service is more like uh, housing uh, programs. Okay, or public service. Hmm. Right. Okay. Um, I, Maria, Robert do you want Carrera? me to jump in and answer that question? Yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> That's, a, that's that's what I understand, but go ahead. Okay, yes. perfect. Good evening, Mayor, members of the council, Paul Ashby, Adams Ashby Group. Um, so public services are going to be any type of program that you offer. So youth services, Meals on Wheels, homeless shelter facilities, uh, youth services, and CDBG uh, at HUD caps those at 15%. So that's why we always refer to them as public service or non-public service funds. So the agencies that apply for those dollars through the city, there's a limited amount that we can offer. And everything else falls into just non-public service, which can be housing, economic development, 
public infrastructure, public facilities, et cetera. And that is not limited? It's not limited. There's no cap on those funds. No cap on those. Be besides okay. what your allocation is, obviously, but there's no right. percentage. Right. Correct. Okay. And so when I see Meals on Wheels as the project, even though the agency is the health trust, how does that Meals on Wheels project differ from what's coming up later on our agenda, for example, um, that will be for uh, 40 seniors? Is it the same Meals on Wheels? Or are there multiple Meals on Wheels? It's different. And I can, I'll, Maria, I'll let you answer that um, based on the YMCA's yeah. explanation so on that. So the, the, the YMCA has, as you know, they, um, and we could get more into it at, you know, during the next presentation. Yeah. We cover it, but uh, the the YMCA's program, the ones that we're going to be requesting funding or approval for, are for um, seniors who are currently registered with the senior center, uh, but they're not able to pick up their meals. I okay. think meals is more of a, a countywide effort, more larger scale, and 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 the one that we're going to be talking about is those that are registered with the senior center that are more local, but uh, they, they don't come to the senior center and access it because they don't have the ability to do so. Okay, okay, so this one here though, never mind the, the, what's coming up on the agenda, the agenda item that we are on, this one for Meals on Wheels, this is for an effort to provide meals countywide? This is a, this is a different one. Uh, it is right. still, still in Gilroy, but it's, it's, an, it's an other agency. It is not the YMCA and they I have understand it's a different agency, but they're providing meals to people where? In Gilroy as okay. well. Just, just in Gilroy. Yes. Yes. The funding okay. is Thank in Gilroy. All right. That's what I was asking. Okay. Then I don't see any other hands raised, so I'm going to continue with my own question. Um, Maria, do you know anything about the reasoning behind um, the commission's reason for omitting? Silicon Valley Independent Living Center. So I asked um, the the chair to uh, Vanessa Ashford uh, and to to be here and to be prepared to answer because that did not come from staff. That came from uh, it was a decision from the from the committee members themselves. So if Miss Vanessa Ashford is there, if she could uh, if you could please uh, respond to Mayor Blankley. Does anyone know if she is here? She just needs to get pulled over from attendees. So you're but saying she's here? Okay. There she is. I'm I know she's here. here. I'm here. Hi. Okay. 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 Yes. So, I don't mean to put you on the spot. Just wonder what 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 your reasoning was, so I can address it. No, um, we're prepared. And Maria, thank you for sharing the letter with uh, with us in advance. Um, so we have a prepared statement as a committee to share which is uh, when presented with the decrease in available grant funding, the HNRC decided to make the difficult decision by funding the agencies that had been able to amend programs to continue to provide the most services during the COVID-19 emergency. So um, there were some programs when we looked at applications that were not even able to serve 50% of their target because of the pandemic. And some agencies were able to serve even more people because they pivoted. So that was the information we used to make our decision, okay. part of it. Right. All right, thank you. And I'll be on standby if anyone else has questions. Okay, does anyone else have, uh, have any questions? All right, then uh, this would be the time to go to public comment. Oh, okay, Councilman Sorry. Robert Harris, and then yeah. I'll go to public comment, okay? Sure. Um, so if the organizations weren't able to um, provide services during the pandemic or because of pandemic, what about the services that they are proposing uh, for future as we're coming out of the shelter in place and different, um, different regulations? Were those taken, was that taken into consideration? So uh, on the grant application and the information that we received, we did not receive any proposed plans or ideas on how that could happen. One of the specific barriers that was listed in the agency's recommendation was that it was uh, 
due to the provision of remote services, many consumers had limited or no access to internet or device to access remotely. It said working on creative ideas to get services to the community. So had there been a specific plan or map, uh, we could have taken that into consideration, but that was the explanation that we were provided with. And when comparing it to, um, to you know, other agencies and what they were able to do, we had to, I mean, we had to cut even more money than we thought we had to cut, right? And so we really wanted to make sure that we were getting the money to the agencies that serve the most people the best. Does that answer your question? Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Vanessa. I don't envy the position you were in. And I think if we're in a question, if any council member, after we go to public comment, wants to change anything, you can certainly make a suggestion. But I, I think the committee has done, um, I'm sure, the quite a thorough and the best job that they could with the information that they had. Okay, do we have any public comments on this item? Yes, we have two people raising their hands. Uh, right. Teresa Johnson, you may talk. Okay, um, please make, everybody must stay under three minutes, okay? Make sure you're aware before you start. Okay. Hi, my name is Teresa Johnson and I'm uh, the Director of Food and Nutrition Services at the Health Trust. We wanna thank the council and the members of the committee for your continued support for our Meals on Wheels program for elderly people. Uh, this year we're asking um, for funding that will cover the cost of about 2,200 meals and a little bit of our driver cost. Um, in addition to the people that we will serve under your um, funding, we serve a number of other clients in the city of Gilroy. Currently, we have three other grants that cover um, residents outside of the city of Gilroy, uh, outside the county of Santa Clara, but our services do um, serve for the entire county of Santa Clara, but your funding will be restricted and leveraged for support for Gilroy clients. Um, I just wanna say that um, we had major changes over the COVID year. We started off prior to the COVID shutdown serving 1700 meals a week in our county. Three weeks after the shutdown, we were serving 9,000 meals a week. And by the end of June, we were serving 12,000 meals a week. We've settled down to a huge number in my mind of 7,000 meals per week. Uh, we are not seeing a huge decrease in the demand. In fact, the de demand is continuing. I don't have a clock, so just tell me when to stop. Um, but what I wanted to say is that we are now estimating that next year we will serve about 300,000 meals in our county to seniors and those who um, are homebound due to chronic illness. Our vendor um, provides very healthy meals. Um, they're delicious. We serve them hot or frozen, depending on the needs of the clients. We have a socialization program for our clients where they can meet and get friendly visits or do that over the phone. And we provide small gifts for them and assistance in social services through our social work program. So we wanna thank you for your continued support and just know that um, we partner with the other nonprofits that you fund to provide resource and referral. And we all work together to make sure your citizens are, are taken care of. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, next speaker. We have Sherry Burns. You may speak now. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Blankley and members of the City Council. My name is Sherry Burns and I'm the Executive Director of Silicon Valley Independent Living Center. I previously submitted a letter for your consideration on item 8A, so I'll just share some brief comments this evening. First, I wanna thank the City of Gilroy for years of past support for SVLC's housing and emergency services to lower income residents with disabilities. The City's Housing Trust Fund allocation has allowed us to leverage additional funding so that we can maintain a full service branch office in the City of Gilroy and provide easy to access services for families in need of housing support, advocacy, and emergency food and rent assistance. Last year, we served 68 Gilroy families directly, and this year we have served over 50 thus far, including helping families with much needed rent relief so that they could maintain their housing and avoid homelessness. Food and rent assistance requests have gone up exponentially among our clientele 
due to the pandemic and economic downturn. We are currently on target to meet our grant deliverables for this year. For the 2021 year, the staff recommended SVLC for a housing trust fund allocation of $15,530 to support our continued housing and emergency services. However, the HNRC voted not to support our services, even though Gilroy families, including those with disabilities, are still struggling to make ends meet. Gilroy is blessed to have several dedicated and impactful agencies who work hard at helping the most underserved and vulnerable families continue to thrive in the community. SVLC is one of those important providers. I respectfully ask that you consider supporting SVLC continuance of services to Gilroy families in the coming year by utilizing CARES Act funds or monies that could be freed up by funding one of our community's essential housing advocacy partners, Project Sentinel, through CDBG administrative funds or home funds. Thank you for your past support and thoughtful consideration of this request. And lastly, kudos to the Gilroy Youth Commission for their tremendous accomplishments. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, are there any other speakers? Yes, we have uh, Elena Purcell, you may speak. Okay, I'm starting the clock. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me on today. My name is Elena Purcell. I am the Associate Director of Development at Rebuilding Together Silicon Valley. Um, we'd like to thank all of our council members, the HNRC members, and the staff of the City of Gilroy for your funding recommendations for Rebuilding Together's Home Repair, Rehab, and Accessibility Program. I thank you on behalf of the longtime Gilroy residents and homeowners who have invested in this community and would like to remain in their home in the midst of their support systems where they can age in place. One of the goals of Rebuilding Together is to make it possible for these residents to not only safely age in place, but to thrive in place as they remain independent without the stress and burden of costly safety modifications and overdue repairs. 52% of our clients say it's easier for them to enter and exit the home as a result of our work. One in three of our homeowners say they now plan to age in place. 90% felt less stress about repairs and maintenance six months after receiving our services. This year with the additional stresses that none of us could have imagined, along with the importance of having a safe home in which to shelter, our work has become more important than ever. The challenges that COVID has brought our way as an organization has made this a tough year to consistently deliver our services in a COVID safe manner. This has impacted our ability to reach as many as we can, but the need is great nevertheless. Each and every homeowner we assist can remain in the place they've called home for decades. We prevent homelessness and preserve affordable housing by easing the financial burden and taking care of their repairs so these long-term Gilroy residents can remain in the midst of their trusted support systems. We do hope you will consider funding RTSV at our original request of 159,000. And with the increases we are seeing in all costs related to our work, a grant increase to 167,000 will restore our ability to assist Gilroy residents at pre-COVID levels. $167,000 would allow us to spend just 7,500 per home which is a relatively small investment toward creating a sustainable solution to preserving that home as a safe and affordable option for years to come. We thank you again for your trust in our program to deliver to the residents of Gilroy. And of course, for our home repair and accessibility modifications needed to keep seniors and people with disabilities safe in their homes. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay, before I ask for more speakers, uh, Christina, the last three are still online. Can you? Um, remove them from the from yes. our meeting and there's no other speakers okay so i'm going to wait for you to remove teresa johnson sherry burns and elena purcell they are still there mayor i actually have a question for elena if she could oh she just oh. left <laughs> That's oh, okay. sorry. I saw your hand. I didn't know it was for one of the speakers. That's okay. okay there are still, yeah. Okay. So while, while she's doing that, um, council member Marks, what is your question? Well, I don't know. Maybe Maria could help me here. Um, do you know um, how many households rebuilding together Silicon Valley actually helps with their money? 
No, I, I don't. Um, I know it's in their application. I don't, I don't have it on me right now, but I can find out and get back to you. Okay. I don't have it on hand. Okay. Or right. if Elena can call back in real quickly, that would be great. All right, thank you. Well, or Vanessa uh, might- Council, Council oh, Member yeah. Marks, if I, can, if I can jump in, Maria, if you don't sure. mind. Okay. Do. Um, in, in general, I would say that the average around that $7,500 mark is typically what they're giving, $10,000 maybe, $7,500. So the last few years, you've been funding them at around $140,000 to $150,000. So that number divided into that is probably, I'm going to say it's like 18 to 20 households. That's a rough approximation. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's... 140,000 divided by 7,500 is 18.67. And right now in our uh, report, the suggestion from the committee and from staff is 140,000, not the 167 that the caller was just requesting. Right. Okay, so um, we have no more public comment. Back to council discussion. So the, I mean, what's before us is the allocation of this money. Uh, you see in your staff report how, uh, how the commission suggested things be allocated. So the question is, is does somebody wanna make a motion or does somebody have a suggestion for a change? Is how, I'm sorry, council member. Okay, council member Amadaris. I'm, I'm wondering how um, we can make this work so that um, any kind of services um, aren't, aren't left behind, right? Because if if the independent living center covers a population that um, the housing trust or Project Sentinel or one of our other grantees um, doesn't um, because of their um, special focus, how can we make it work so that we can get them um, some money to help our residents? Yes, you'd have to make a suggestion that it come from something else that's mm -hmm. there. That would be for yeah. you to suggest if that's what you would like to do. Um, okay, are there any other uh, comments while she's maybe thinking yeah, over like, what she wants to? Yes, Maria? Um, in anticipation of that question, uh, if, I, if it's okay, I could share my screen. Uh, we did do another table where it shows that everybody who asks for money does get funded, which is okay. what happened in the past, except it'll be obviously at a, at a, at a little bit of- a because the money that was designated to this one agency will now be, you know, spread out. Uh, but it, we are able to do that if that's what you are uh, suggesting. Um, but the, the funds would be less for each. For everybody. So it's taking a little bit away from all of right. the other. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I went through this process a, a few times when I was on the committee. Um, okay. But I'm wondering, there's a, a, an uh, agenda item coming up where we're requesting money from the CARES Act. Um, but I don't see the independent living center on that request. Is that true? I think Jimmy. Yes, it is. It is true. But um, the the CARES Act monies are yeah. only uh, they only go to agencies uh, that um, that are dealing with uh, COVID impacts, mm -hmm. right? So they're only used to mitigate impacts for low income residents on COVID. So if an agency is is requesting funding for the same services year after year. It's not, they're not doing anything different to address COVID impacts. So the, the ones that you're gonna be coming before you actually are addressing agencies that are, that are dealing with addressing their customers that are impacted by COVID. Right, okay. That makes would, sense, thank you. Okay, so would the council like to see the, the two, the one that Maria has prepared in anticipation of the question as compared to to this to see, would you like to see that? I'm seeing some heads nodding. Yes, I see. yes. Okay, so why don't we do that, Maria, so the council can see, and then maybe we will get a motion for one of the two. Okay, one moment, Chair, as I, uh, Mayor, as I share. Mm -hmm. So here is, uh, has independent, uh, Silicon Valley independent living, and here are the funding amounts that I you see. see. And go uh, there, and here are the funding amounts for everybody, 
right? So I'll go to the next page. So it's still a 607, but there is an increase. And I could go back to the first one so you can see. Uh, let's see if I can do that. Well, is it a pro rata allocation that you did? In other words, did you take, no, okay, no. Okay, so here it is um, yeah. without the agency. So there, 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 there's yeah. a map in the new so one. Council, what I would suggest is everybody have what's in their packet in front of them, it's page 27. And then Maria could just show us the, the new slide. That way you can compare page 27 and page uh, 20, 27. Yeah, 27 and 28, if you want to see what the differences are. All of the ones in our packet, every like adult live oak daycare, 8560 now is 7910. Bay Area Community Health, 10,250 now is 9480. So everything's just gone down some in order to accommodate what? So how much? Oh, there it, oh, so they all go down some, but then Silicon Valley Independent Living gets the whole 15? No. That, no. I, no, that that is with uh, the reduced amount. They're it's asking. Going. Oh, because fifteen five thirty is what I see in their letter. Um, I mean, I, I'm just trying to get make sure that we all understand what it is. If that's what it is, it's fine. It's what I well I'll do is we'll confirm those numbers. Well, we have our analyst right here, Robert. Okay, <laughs> Robert has his hand. Yeah, do, would, would you like to say something, Robert? Help us out. Uh, yes, uh, Mayor and Council, the that number that fifteen five three zero that you're seeing that the Silicon Valley Independent Living Center has suggested that is the reduced amount that staff came forth with and recommended to the HNRC when it oh. came forward and recommended. So all these numbers you've seen, okay, they were reduced amounts they were applied equally and uh, equitably to ensure that we meant our spending cap limits. Okay, and the health trust, that is now a total number, whereas before it was split into two? Yes. Okay. Okay, is everybody clear? Um, and if so, does someone want to make a motion? I'll make the motion. Uh, motion to approve the community development block grant and housing trust fund public service grant allocation for fiscal year 2021-2022. Fiscal I'll Which one? That. <laughs> the I'm original. Sorry. The original. And, and, okay. and I'll, I'll, I just want to, I've watched the meetings that HNRC had on this. And one of the biggest things is that they did not want to water down, if you will, spread over, over all, right. but really focus on making a big impact on those that they chose to, uh, that they chose to fund. And I agree okay. with that method. So the motion is to go with as recommended in our staff reports and seconded by council member Tovar. Correct? Yes. Okay. Roll call vote. Um, Councilmember Armendariz? Yes. Councilmember Bracco? Yes. Councilmember Hilton? Yes. Councilmember Lara Munoz? Yes. Councilmember Marks? Yes. Councilmember uh, Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blankley? Yes. All right. So that passes unanimously. Okay, item B, consideration of amendments to the 2019-2020 Annual Action Plan for funding received under the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, CARES, CV3 Part A, related to the COVID-19 pandemic in the amount of $422,085. And Maria, you're giving this staff report. Well, one more time, ma'am, one more one time. One more time. One moment um, as I uh, share. Okay. And this council members or the public packet page 34 is where the uh, numbers are. Okay, good evening. Uh, my name is Maria de Leon, Program Administrator for the City of Gilroy. Tonight I'm requesting approval on the amendment to the fiscal year uh, 19 and fiscal year 20 CDBG annual action plan for supplemental funding established by the CARES Act. Uh, as part of the coronavirus 
Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, also known as CARES Act, Gilroy will receive an additional $422,085 in CDBG funds, classified as CDBG CV3 Part A funds. The CARES Act allows these funds to support low-income community members negatively impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The distribution of the CARES Act funding requires an amendment to the fiscal year 2019-2020 annual action plan. The amended action plan will identify the proposed reallocations and identify the projects to be funded. So on April 2020, City Council directed staff to focus the first round of recommendations on rental assistance and small businesses. Out of the $619,715 in CARES Act and CDBG funds, to date, $598,715 has been spent. An additional $422,085 in COVID relief aid was awarded as part of HUD relief package to provide much needed support due to this long standing pandemic. So the CARES Act funds must follow strict grant guidelines to support local families, economic development and vulnerable population. And as a result, city staff recommends the additional CARES Act to support rent relief economic development and senior food distribution efforts. Rent relief will be provided to persons and households directly impacted by the loss of employment or reduction of work hours due to the pandemic. So currently, the City of Gilroy partners with the St. Joseph's Family Center to provide rent relief for the first round of CARES Act funds. So St. Joseph's Family Center was successful with the distribution of 150,000 in rent relief within only a few months of announcement. So in February 2021, when the funds ran out, the agency had a waiting list of families needing rental assistance. So the allocation of the additional 137,000 would benefit these families. With a process that we already have in place with St. Joseph, it would be seamless to continue working with this agency with the distribution of the CDBG CV3 Part A funds. The economic impact of the pandemic has greatly impacted small businesses. Examples of impacts include mass layoffs, business closures, uncertainty in reopening due to the health and safety guidelines, and inability to embrace e-commerce and customer and staff safety. So with small businesses being as fragile as they are, city staff recommends a continuance of economic development support. Currently, the Gilroy Chamber of Commerce has been successful in the distribution of a round of small business grants. The chamber has also has a waiting list of businesses needing support for their business operations to avoid local job loss. The city of Gilroy has had a positive experience working with the Gilroy Chamber of Commerce with the small business grants again, and it would be seamless to continue working with the chamber for the distribution of $100,000 in CDBG CB3 Part A funds. Many low-income seniors lack access to healthy foods and adequate nutrition on a daily basis. So although social distancing is necessary to limit the spread of virus, anything that deters people from accessing group meals at a senior center or food banks puts low-income seniors in dangers of malnutrition and of hunger. Many Gilroy seniors also typically cannot afford to stock up on food or supplies. If they can, they need transportation assistance to and from the grocery stores. To address this issue, the city of Gilroy is looking to expand its existing partnership with the YMCA on daily meal distribution. In addition to an already nutritious to-go lunches being given out of the Gilroy Senior Center daily, these additional CARES Act funds will be used for the preparation and dropping off of fully cooked meals to homebound seniors. There are seniors who are not able to drive, walk, or make arrangements to pick up their meals from the Gilroy Senior Center for various reasons. They either lack transportation, have physical challenges, are recuperating of medical issues, or are quarantined due to COVID-19 or maybe have been exposed to COVID-19 themselves. They will have their meals dropped off at their home daily by the YMCA staff. 
As a result, these seniors can remain healthy, continue social distancing, maintain their independence, retain their dignity, and stay safe due to medical vulnerabilities during the pandemic. The city of Gilroy has had a positive and effective relationship and experience working with the YMCA for many years with their daily nutrition program. So with the process already in place, it would be seamless to continue working with the YMCA distribution of the CDBG CV3 Part A funds. I do wanna point out that in the uh, annual action plan in, the, in one of the tables, we do refer to this program as Meals on Wheels. And I, I just explained earlier that this was not Meals on Wheels. It's actually the Healthy Meal Delivery Program. That's the title of it. So. I don't want any copyright infringements. No, we can't have that. It's a new okay. So uh, in terms of administration fees, since the beginning of the pandemic in March 2020, city staff has been managing, tracking, and administering CARES Act and CDBG funding relating, related to the pandemic. This includes federal and state monies to monitor and support COVID-impacted families with rent relief and economic development support. City staff has not included an administration fee for any of the pandemic related grant oversight and management. Oversight of federal and state grant funds is a lot of work. I could attest to it myself. It's cumbersome, it takes up a lot of time and requires much attention. Again, as listed on the, on the slide, you know, we have to meet all grant guidelines, develop and set up sanctioned programs, promote programs through various social media outlets, tracking grant processes, submitting required reports and documentation, meeting all grant timelines, negotiating contracts with their agencies, providers, establishing weekly progress meetings with these agencies, as well as troubleshooting roadblocks and obstacles, and then preparing staff reports for city council presentation and updates. So to date, the city of, of Gilroy's have, has received 980,000 in CARES Act and CDBG pandemic related funding. So grant city staff is re, requesting the administration or is, is inserting an administration fee for grant oversight that's included in, in the proposal. So uh, a public hearing notice of the proposed amendment and a five day public comment period for April 23, 2021 through April 29, 2021 was posted on the city's webpage. It was a five day public comment period and the approval, uh, approval of the fiscal year 2019-2020 CDBG annual action plan for supplemental funding established by the CARES Act will not have an impact on the general fund. This concludes my presentation and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Maria. Okay, if you could uh, clear the screen. Right, there we go. So I can see everybody. And I want to say, I, I know your, your position has been almost 100% going towards COVID related things. So to get some reimbursement from that is not asking a lot at all. All right, um, any council members have questions of the report we just heard before I go to public comment? Okay, then let's go to public comment. Um, Christina, do we have anybody from the public who wants to speak on this item? Currently we have no, uh, no one raising their hands. Um, if you wish to speak, please raise your hand or um, click star, uh, star nine to unmute yourself. Okay, why do I see a Teresa Perez? So these are people that are attending the meeting, watching in, and those two people on that last list were asked to be removed. They weren't, they're just attendees. They're not on panelists. So they shouldn't get kicked out. <laughs> I'm not kicking anybody out. I just want to make sure that because I'm seeing them like I see council members and people who are supposed to be here. Okay, so I, if, if there's confirmation that they are here as attendees only, then that's fine. That's not how it looks to me. They are. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so then um, there are no public comments. So is there any uh, discussion among the council? Or does someone want to make a motion? Ms. Dion, I'll make a motion to approve as is. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion by Council Member Bracco, seconded by Council Member Hilton to approve an amendment to the fiscal year 2019-2020 CDBG annual action plan 
for supplemental funding established by the CARES Act to provide rental assistance, support to small business affected by COVID-19 pandemic and meals for seniors. Uh, roll call, please. Council member Adam Yes. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Council member Bracco? Yes. Council member Hilton? Yes. Council member Lura Munoz? Yes. Council member Marks? Yes. Council member Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blankley? Yes. Yes, that passes unanimously. All right, item 9A, unfinished business, interim objective design standards. And that staff report is coming from Cindy McCormick. Hello, Cindy. Good evening. On March 8th, the council provided direction on their expectations for the city's multifamily residential objective design standards and requested that the consultant prepare interim standards by the end of April. The goal for the interim standards was to create design criteria that could be applied to new multifamily proposals as soon as possible, but also allow time to gather input that will be incorporated into a more comprehensive set of objective design standards. The interim standards include design requirements for multifamily residential projects related to building orientation, massing and articulation, entries and stairwells, colors and materials, open space and common areas, lighting, fences and walls, and utilities and service areas. The more comprehensive standards will include additional standards as well as graphics that help illustrate the intent behind the standards. Following feedback from the City Council, the interim standards will be updated and posted on the City's website and provided to project applicants who intend to develop multifamily residential projects in the City of Gilroy. The consultant and staff will continue to refine the standards based on feedback from the Council, the residents, and the development community. I am aware of at least one public comment letter that was provided to the Council this morning and have heard from others that they intend to submit feedback over the coming weeks. It is anticipated that the more comprehensive standards will be presented to the Planning Commission no later than August and to the City Council no later than September of this year. This concludes my presentation and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, Council, any questions of Cindy? Okay, I'll go to public comment. Um, Christina, do we have anybody wishing to speak on this item? Currently, we have no raised hands. Um, if you wish to speak on this item, please raise your hand now um, or press star nine to unmute yourself. We have none. Okay, back to council. If there are no, oh, okay, I see a hand. Council member Hilton. Thank you, Mary Blankley. Um, Cindy, when we say multifamily residential, what are we, what are we talking about? Are we talking about everything besides a single family home or do we start it at a certain unit number? So we consider duplex to be a multifamily. So anything larger than a duplex or including a duplex. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so this is just, we're supposed to be providing direction to staff. I, I don't, I don't think that this is a, there's a motion that I'm looking for, correct? Um, I'll, I'll make a motion. I think you're looking for this to be interim for right now, right? And then you'd come back later with the original. Is that what you're looking for? Because if so, I, I'm ready to make a motion for it. I think it's really, right, really well, good that, to have these other stuff now. Yeah, right. so if you all are, if you are happy with the interim standards, we can go ahead and post those on the website tomorrow send them out to the development community, and then we'll bring it back to the commission and the council this fall. Yeah, thank you. I, this isn't something that requires a motion. Thank you. Okay, great. So is that what everybody's happy with then? What, so Wait. you just said? Okay. So it's so what, a thumbs up? Okay, That's thank you. a little awkward, All right? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry I'm not handling the meeting the way you would, okay? You've under the circumstances, a thumbs up is a under the circumstances, a thumbs up is a reasonable way to give direction here. So, yeah, we'll thank you, it. Andy. Right. You're welcome. <laughs> Boy, okay. Um, item B: Council Unhoused Ad Hoc Committee Update. Okay, and I think Council Member Marks, are you going to be giving that to us tonight? Yes. Yes, I am. Great. Okay. 
All right. So the number of unhoused in Gilroy is becoming an increasing issue. At a recent South County Plan to End Homelessness webinar, according to the 2019 census regarding the unhoused, the city of Gilroy has documented 704 residents in comparison to Morgan Hills 114. As a result of this growing problem, at a September 8, 2020 Homeless City Council study session, City Council supported the creation of an ad hoc committee. Council Member Bracco, Tovar, and myself were appointed to begin discussions on the city's next steps in addressing the unhoused problem. At the April 19, 2021 City Council meeting, the unhoused ad hoc committee presented to the City Council 12 recommendations for the City Council's consideration. At this meeting, the City Council added two recommendations, totaling 14. After receiving City Council support for the 14 recommendations, the UAHC has identified five recommended priorities that would have an immediate impact for all citizens. Slide, please. Number one, establish a safe parking program. Number two, support a mobile garbage removal program. Three, explore the purchasing of a garbage compactor truck. Four, hire a quality of life officer. Five, explore the differences between a police officer and a community service officer. The UAHC members want to inform city council that committee members and city staff will further examine these options and return to city council with program details and estimated program costs at an upcoming city council meeting. There will be fiscal impacts with these recommendations. Funding for these efforts will need to come from the general fund and will be included in the city administrator's fiscal year 2022 and 2023 recommended budget. It is anticipated that a portion of the one-time CARES Act relief funds can be used to financially support these recommendations. This concludes my update and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, council member. Um, Again, can we remove this from the screen so I can uh, see everyone and then I'll know if anybody uh, has their hand raised and has a question. Okay, I don't see any hands raised, so I'm going to go to the public and ask Christina if there are any, if there's anybody from the public who wants to speak on this issue. We have um, one raising their hand, A. Barrera, you may speak. Okay, you have three minutes, please. Thank you for coming. Hi, council members and mayor. Thank you uh, for taking my comment uh, once again. Um, I just wanna raise um, some awareness with uh, the urgency of adopting the safe parking or any of those measures that you spoke on. Um, on June 30th of this year, the moratorium in California is set to expire. And there's around 43,000 renters in Santa Clara County that are at risk of losing their home. So there will be an increased need uh, for, for the safe parking and other programs that uh, you guys are promoting. So uh, I highly recommend that if the city can adopt this, that it, it do so to reduce that impact on the city. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? No. Okay. Uh, and this is just a receive report. There is uh, no action here. Um, I suppose this isn't the time to quantify any of those things, Carol. There's no number in mind as to how what it would cost for all of those different things. No, no. and maybe we get to some of them and not to all, but at least it's a, it's a start. Correct. Okay, thank you. You're all right. Very good then. Moving on to uh, introduction of new business. Resolution proclaiming the month of June as LGBTQ Pride Month. And uh, staff report, Jimmy, this is in three parts, but Jimmy, you're giving the report. So we'll start with that and then we'll go one part at a time. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the city council at your March 1st uh, council meeting, you directed staff to return to council for consideration of a proclamation for the month of June, uh, recognizing lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender uh, and queer or questioning 
uh, Pride Month as the month of June 2021. Included in that direction was the uh, consideration of flying the, the pride flag at City Hall uh, during the month of June as well. Uh, this evening, uh, staff is returning with uh, those two uh, considerations for you and also the consideration that the um, city determine a formal flag flying policy. Uh, at this time, the city uh, does not receive a lot of these types of requests to fly flags but seeing that we do not have a policy is something that uh, council uh, could direct staff to return at a future meeting uh, in order to adopt to have some guidelines for when uh, council considers these types of requests. Uh, so those are the three areas we're asking you to look at tonight. Um, we have um, provided you a resolution for the month uh, for your consideration and then the other two uh, opportunities to direct staff uh, concerning the flag and the flag policy. So I'd be happy to answer any questions for you. That concludes my report. Okay. Does anyone have questions for Jimmy? Council Member Bracco. Jimmy, um, uh, uh, for as long as you have been here, um, have we had requests to fly different flags at City Hall? I cannot recall receiving any others, no. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions of Jimmy, I'm going to uh, open the, go to public comments and then uh, we'll come back for discussion and take these one at a time. All right, Christina, are there any public, it's just so strange for me to see commenters uh, photos here on the screen, but, um, and we still have a hand raised by the last caller. Uh, but if that has to stay there, then so be it. Can you just let me know if there are any other people wanting to speak? Currently none, but if you wish to speak, pre please press uh, star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand at this time. Seeing none. Okay, then council, let's go through these one at a time. So the first item is to um, adopt a resolution proclaiming the month of June as LGBTQ Pride Month. Um, so, sorry? Mayor. Okay, okay. Council Member Tobar, you have a comment here? Yeah, thank you. And, um, and thank you for all for, um, for um, approving my request to have this on the agenda. That wasn't mentioned by our city um, administrator. But again, what I'm asking my fellow council members to do is support me in passing a, a re resolution and authorizing the display of the pride flag at City Hall um, annually. Um, so that that's the request that I've, I'm making. As you all know, we've had some letters of support from our local assembly member and state senator um, also um, supporting this as well. So again, I'm asking that um, my fellow council members, again, um, help help push this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Yes, this was brought, this was requested by Council Member Tovar and the Council majority approved to have it on the agenda. Okay, Council Member Hilton. Thank you, Mayor Blinkley. Um, so I'd like to share a short story as to why this piece of legislation is so important to me and why I'll be supporting it tonight. Many of you don't know this about me, but I was adopted in the, at birth in the late 70s and raised by two moms. In that time period, same-sex marriages were not legal and neither was it adoption by same-sex couples. My mother at the same time was a new pediatrician at Children's Hospital in Oakland where she completed a residency and would serve for over 30 years. It's the same community for which I have served as a firefighter paramedic for the past 21 years. So imagine the struggles and barriers my mom broke through for being a young gay female in a male dominated profession, all while raising, all while raising her kids in a two mom household. I'm proud of who I am today and what my mom instilled in me. And the symbol of the rainbow flag also known as the LGBTQ plus pride flag and resolution will now support any member of our community by letting them know that Gilray promotes a healthy and safe community for all. Thank you to Senator Laird, Assembly Member Revis and Baymec for supporting this resolution. And I'd like to encourage the Gilray School Board to follow our lead as well. Thank you. All right, um, Council. Okay, I don't know what that means, but Council Member Tovar, your hand was up first. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. And, and, and to my fellow council member Hilton, thank you for those words. Um, that, that, that's, that means a lot to me. So I appreciate that. Um, and again, I, I, you know, I brought this forward again, because I know that um, many of us, you know, 
sort of really want to recognize uh, many of the different individuals in our community. Um, you know, recently I've been receiving some really nasty emails in regards to my proposal here. And it's unfortunate that some individuals um, in their beliefs are very shallow and that don't see the good in this. Um, I personally, again, I think that the purpose of acknowledging sort of the LGBTQ um, is really to, to, to let them know how much we appreciate them. And it's, again, it's, it's, it's to make a statement that uh, we value them here in Gilroy and that we recognize their previous contributions while encouraging and fostering ongoing partnerships and responsibilities of building an inclusive community. So uh, again, I, I, I thank, ahead of time, I thank those council members who are also in support of this. And I thank those uh, many, many community members who have reached out to me in support of this as well. Thank you. Thank you. Council member Armandaris and then followed by council member Bracco. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I wanna thank uh, council member Hilton for his courage and in, in sharing his story and for his moms um, and their courage in um, breaking through barriers and in um, all that they, they faced in, in times that were rough. Um, I'm an LGBTQ mom and aunt and ally, and I uh, wanna support um, the feeling of welcomeness and acknowledgement of the members of our community that are LGBTQ plus. Um, and I think a flag is a good start to do that. Um, folks, uh, members of that community, like in uh, many other communities, they face violence and prejudice and all sorts of um, ugliness. And I, I, as a community leader, I think it's incumbent upon us to help them feel welcome and safe uh, by whatever measures we have at our um, disposal. So I will be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, council and member thank you, Council Member Tovar, for, for proposing it. Sorry. Okay, Council Member Bracco. Yes. Um, I'm going to go ahead and comment now, even though we're going to do them all three differently. Uh, I'm okay with the resolution, but that's as far as I can go. I see this as a very divisive issue for our community. I receive, don't shake your head, Councilman Tovar. Um, I, I received a lot of calls and, and a lot of emails that people weren't too happy about this when they saw it on the agenda. I was actually surprised that so many people actually read our agendas. Um, we've, we've had this in front of us before and councils then uh, decided against it because of you're gonna have to give everybody the, the same right to hang a flag at City Hall. You know, the NRA, Blue, Blue Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, every, everybody gets a shot. Um, and, and I see it causing nothing but problems. And I say it's divisive, you know, there's a lot of, older folks in our community, real conservative folks in our community, that this is offensive to them, to see a flag uh, hanging on city hall. Um, so I, I will be against it. Thank you. All right, council member. Mayor, um, oh. respectfully, no, I'm not gonna uh, come back to Dion's comment to me, so. right. Okay, I'm sorry. Fred, you, you are, of course are welcome to speak, but in turn, right now it's Council Member Laromagnosa's turn. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yeah, looking looking at this issue, I, I think previous speakers have have hit the nail on the head. This is this is in support of recognizing a community that has been uh, victimized, that has been subject to discrimination, uh, to any number of challenges to their basic existence. Um, you know, one of the things that I love about our city is our diversity and our willingness to, to step up and help each other. We saw that before when we've addressed citywide challenges um, and we're, we're not afraid of having these difficult, sometimes divisive discussions. But this is something that we can, we can in, in one uh, show here, we can make a statement that we stand for diversity, we stand for inclusion, we stand for welcomeness. I think those are the strongest values in our city and that's why I'll be voting to support it. Okay, 
Thank you. Council Member Tovar, did you have something else you wanted to say before I go? No, I, I apologize, Dan. I, I didn't expect to be called out. Like Learned it out. It's okay. Yeah, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't expect to be called out like that, and I have every right to shake my head, and oh, I'm respectfully okay. not going to respond to the okay. childish comment. All right. All right. So I, I'm going to um, give my comments here because I, I mean, I agree with so much that has been said tonight. My, my feeling is um, we should be so inclusive. I am, I, 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 nobody should feel uncomfortable being themselves ever. And so that, that is something that I want to make clear that it's just, it's, it's if we can pass a resolution that says that you know we we as a city uh, want to raise or, or heighten awareness, I guess is the is the term to use because we did we all got letters from Robert Revis from Senator Laird and from Bay Mech moving equality forward and and they're all all three of the letters had paragraphs that are verbatim the same, you know so a lot of it is the same but it does say to heighten awareness and that all children should be able to attend school in a safe and inclusive environment, free from discrimination. I couldn't agree more. The same applies to kids with autism. The same applies to uh, people or kids with disabilities or who have been disfigured from accidents or fires or, or anything. I mean, the list goes on. And that that is for that reason that I personally don't take it past item one. We have one, two, and three here. It's because although I have no objection to flying a flag, it is that we cannot fly unlimited numbers of flags. And while this cause is a very good one, so are so many others. And they are in the same category of social acceptance. So I'm just going to say that that is my, you don't have to, it's, no one, it's not a debate. I just am telling, expressing that I do think that inclusion and safe environments and all these things are exactly what we should stand for, but I am not comfortable opening up a door that will then lead us to spending council time every time we have a request to fly a flag when the city of Gilroy should be the city of Gilroy and not taking positions for different groups or activities, even though this particular one I, I understand. And that's why I will be supporting a proclamation, but not a flag. All right, Council Member Tovar, you want to comment a fourth time? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Uh, oh, your sorry, hand is my... raised. Sorry. Yeah, I don't... You don't mean to have your hand raised. Okay, so are there any other, I don't see anybody else's hands raised. So I'm going to ask then, do we have a motion and a second to adopt a resolution proclaiming the month of June as LGBT Pride, sorry, LGBTQ Pride Month? A motion. I second that motion. A motion by Council Member Armadaris and seconded by Council Member Tovar to adopt a resolution proclaiming the month of June 2021 is okay, Pride Month. Um, so I'm going to ask for a, a roll call on just that, if I may. Yes. Um, Council Member Armadaris? Yes. yes. Council Member Bernal? Yes. Council Member Hilton? Yes. Council Member uh, Lero Munoz? Yes. Council Member Marks? Yes. <clears throat> Council Member Tovar? Yes. And uh, Mayor Blankley? Yes. All right, that passed unanimously. So now the second one, so if there's a motion and a second, to direct staff to fly the LGBTQ pride flag at the city civic center during the month of June. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, motion made by council member Hilton and seconded by council member Tovar. Roll call vote there. Council member Armandaris. Enthusiastic, yes. <laughs> council member Bracco. No. Council Member Hilton? Yes. Council Member Laura Munoz? Yes. Council Member Marks? No. Council Member Tovar? I'm shaking my head, yes. <laughs> Council Member Tovar? 
Council member Tovar? He said yes. Yes. All right. And uh, Mayor Blinkley? No. Okay, and then the third item is to direct staff. So again, I need a motion and a second. Oh, I'm sorry, that last one uh, passed four to three. I'm supposed to say that each time and I forgot. The first one was unanimous. The second one was four to three. All right, the third one, uh, direct staff to return to the May 17th, 2021 city council meeting with the recommended flag raising policy for council to consider. Is there a motion so, for that? Sorry. Second. Okay. okay, motion by council member Tovar, seconded by council member Armendaris. Uh, roll call vote. Council member Armendari? Yes. Council member Bracco? No. Council member Hilton? Yes. Council member Laura Munoz? Yes. Council member Marks? No. Council member Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blankley? No. So that passed four to three, and we will be hearing a report on the flag policy at the next meeting. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now on to item B, authorization for the city administrator to execute the countywide AB 939 fee agreement and the countywide household hazardous waste collection agreement. Mm -hmm. Jimmy, take it away. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mayor and members of the city council. The item before you is uh, one that comes to council about every three years and has done so for the last approximately 20 years or so. Uh, the Santa Clara County collects a fee to offset each jurisdiction's solid waste management and hazardous household waste management expenses. Uh, this is called AB 939, named after the bill that enacted uh, such programs as recycling. And so there's two components to this fee. Uh, the first component is the program fee of $1.50 per ton, which is charged to assist in funding the activities. And that is, um, that is charged when people go to the dump. Uh, and then the second part of the fee is the household hazardous waste fee, which is $2.60 per ton. And it's held by the county and used to directly offset the actual program. Uh, the cities are charged uh, according to their participation, and, um, and Gilroy has a very, uh, very large participation in this program. Uh, so the fees that are collected are used uh, to administer both these programs, and any excess fees collected are returned to the city uh, for, for promotions and any other type of uh, act related activities. Uh, your approval would approve the uh, proposed fees for the next three years, and um, would be continuing what has basically happened uh, in the city for the last uh, you know, 20 years or so. Uh, the total fees collected are about $125,000 as well. So uh, that, that's my report. Uh, we have on with us uh, Tony Ulo, who is the program administrator in the city of Morgan Hill and handles a lot of our uh, franchise agreements and, and, and administration of these fees. Uh, we do partner with Morgan Hill, so he could answer more specific questions if you have them. Thank you. Okay, council, anybody with a question? All right, public comments. Christina, anybody from the public wishing to speak on this item? If you wish to speak on this item, please press uh, star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand. See none. Okay, back to council. I, I would move approval of the adoption of a resolution. All right, is there a second? Second. All right, I have a motion by council member LaRomagno, seconded by council member Tovar to receive report and provide authorization for the city administrator to execute the countywide AB 939 fee agreement and the countywide household hazardous waste collection agreement. Roll call vote. Christina, roll call vote. Going. Uh oh. Christina, you're breaking up. Yeah. Um, if you. Oh boy. Connection here. Technology. 
technology is fabulous when it works. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a local internet issue as opposed to anything with the meeting because everybody else is coming in pretty yeah, clearly. Yeah, right. No, I know. Um, is, Madam Mayor, I can take the roll call. Roll, I was going to say, could you. Leanne or Jimmy okay. do that? Okay, thanks. I'll, I'll just do it. Okay. Councilmember Marks? Yes. Uh, Councilmember Bracco? Yes. Councilmember Leroy Munoz? Yes. Councilmember Tovar? Yes. Councilmember Armendariz? Yes. Councilmember Hilton? Yes. And Mayor Blankley? Yes, that passes unanimously. All right, thank you all. Item C, adoption of a resolution to extend temporary suspension of enforcement of sections of the Gilroy City Code to implement a business stimulus package to support and assist businesses affected by COVID-19. Karen, I think you are here for this report. That is correct. Can you All see right. my screen okay? Yes, we can. Okay. Great. Well, thank you, Mayor and members of the council. Uh, as a reminder, just about a year ago, it was on June 1st of last year, where council um, passed a series of uh, things that helped with our businesses at the time when we were just beginning to feel the impacts of COVID-19. And what these were were actually a, a temporary suspension of the enforcement of certain sections of the city code. And what this allowed businesses to do was to respond to the pandemic and respond to the health uh, county and state health orders and do some things that normally they may not be able to do under our codes, but we allowed them to do so. So, you know, one year later, we, um, of course, at that time, didn't think we'd be having this conversation a year later, but we are and uh, still under, you know, some restrictions. And so in looking at the uh, different measures that were passed, uh, some we found really weren't all that necessary. You know, we just kind of anticipated what we may need and either they sort of took care of themselves or in one uh, situation, the state uh, stepped in and others were very well received and used. So uh, I'm just gonna talk about the ones mainly uh, that we are proposing for council to carry forward. Um, although the first one I wanted to mention is the planning entitlement permit extensions. And actually the state stepped in and did uh, pass a law that extended uh, permit extensions from 18 months beyond whatever the uh, last or you know whatever the last expiration date was. So uh, in essence, most uh, permits, uh, and this would be for subdivisions, uh, now extend into I think it was November of next year. They have uh, quite a while to go. Um, and so we felt that was uh, fine just to leave it with the state that there was no uh, nothing additional the city need to do in that case. And as we found, uh, for the most part, uh, development has not really slowed down. So um, even though this is out there, we really haven't had a lot of uh, developers take advantage of it. Uh, the ones that we are recommending are extended for another year would be for temporary signs. And really what this was, was just not requiring businesses to submit a permit to the planning department for temporary type signs. They still have to abide by all the regulations under the temporary sign ordinance. They just don't have to submit a permit. So it just takes that step out and makes it easier for them. Um, it also actually allowed one additional A-frame sign and some directional signs. And that was specific for the needs of businesses in responding to the pandemic and having to you know, put an A-frame out there to direct people where to park for you know, picking up food or directing them you know, if one of their exits or one of their um, you know, store entries was the main one they wanted to go in to have some directional signs to get people where they need to be. So we do recommend extending that for another year till May 31st, 2022. And then use of parking spaces and parking lots for curbside pickup. Again, sort of uh, you know, using some of those spaces, if you will, just for the purpose of pickup, which a lot of businesses are still continuing to do. So we recommend extending that for another year. And then the one that probably had the most use was uh, a couple of different things, but all related. And this had to do mainly with our, our restaurants and being able to use either city right of way, such as sidewalks or a parking space, or even uh, businesses that are in a private shopping center to use their 
parking lots in a way to provide for outdoor seating. And what we did is we made a very simplified process so that we had information on file for the businesses that wanted to take advantage of that. But uh, essentially, once they filled out this form and submitted it to us, they could go ahead and start doing this outdoor dining. And then we'd review that information. If there were any little minor things we needed to work with them on, we would follow up with them and do that. So uh, we did that. And with the parklets, which is when you build a structure out in public right of way, such as uh, Station 55 Restaurant did, that uh, requires a little more uh, overview from city staff, but we were still able to create a program that was relatively uh, fast for them to uh, establish a parklet. Uh, why we're recommending or part of the reason we're recommending to extend this one another year is we'll take some time during this next year to look at a permanent program. And really the, the main differences we see are, are more about uh, the aesthetics and maybe having some um, you know, continuity of the way these, these look. What we did for the temporary program is just, you know, whatever it takes to get your business out there and continue to uh, operate, we were going to be okay with that. And so now as we're starting to transition into permanent and we're, we're hearing businesses may want to continue doing this, even if all the, um, County regulations, uh, you know, allow for businesses to fully open that there's still a lot of interest in doing outdoor dining. So we want to establish a permanent program. Um, the other thing that we're going to take a look at is even though we really already focus on the life safety aspect, there's probably a few more tweaks we can do to make sure uh, that it is safe. So for example, we don't like our, our uh, deputy fire marshal makes him very nervous when there is a propane propane heater under a canvas or plastic tent. So that's something we're probably going to address. So um, that's the other one we're recommending extending for a year and we'll come back during that time with a permanent program. So with that, if there's any questions, a couple of examples of some of our businesses that have done uh, sidewalk dining and, and station 55 with the parklet. So happy to answer any questions. Okay, sorry, I muted myself for a while because birds are super loud right outside my window and I didn't know if that was disturbing the presentation. I don't know what's going on out there. All right, council, any, uh, any questions for Karen? Okay, then I will go to public comments. Uh, Christina, do we have any members of the public wishing to speak on this item? If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand. Seeing and hearing none. Okay, back to council. Any more discussion or council member Bracco? Yeah, I thought uh, Karen had added some uh, sound effects to her presentation. I but you can hear the birds? Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> I'd like to go ahead and make a motion to approve. Okay. All right, is there a second? I'll second that. Okay, motion by council member Bracco, seconded by council member LaRoman Yost <laughs> to adopt a resolution of the city council of the city of Gilroy to extend the temporary suspension of the enforcement of certain sections of the Gilroy city code in an effort to support businesses and development activity and aid in the economic recovery of the city resulting from the impacts of COVID-19. Roll call vote. Council member Armendariz? Yes. Council member Bracco? Yes. Council member Hilton? Yes. Council member Laura Munoz? Yes. Council member Marks? Yes. Council member Tovar? Yes. And Mayor Blankley? Yes, and that passes unanimously. Okay. So that brings us to item 11, city administrators reports. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have just a couple of quick things and then I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Jim Wyatt to give you an update on COVID-19 numbers in Gilroy. Uh, since we didn't have that agenda, I see you can do it under my report. Oh, right, okay. Uh, Council does have an upcoming budget workshop on May 24th. And we are also scheduling a community meeting on the budget on May 25th. Uh, that'll be the first time that both uh, the council and the public uh, get to see the proposed budget for the next two years. 
So I wanted to give the public uh, that uh, upcoming item. Uh, so uh, Chief White, if you wanna go ahead and break into the, the COVID-19 discussion, please do. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Uh, yeah, um, Honorable Mayor and Council, I just wanted to give you uh, the latest uh, vaccination stats for Gilroy, and they're actually looking pretty good. And this is as, as of eight, uh, April 30th of this year. Um, the eligible population to get the vaccine 16 years and over is um, 42,150. And um, of this group, 31,285 have uh, received at least one dose of the vaccine. So that puts us at about 74.2% of the population that's eligible to get the vaccine, which is uh, extremely good. Um, countywide, uh, we're ahead of the county by about four points. So um, it's, a, it's very encouraging to see that the uh, that Gilroy, the citizens of Gilroy and the residents of Gilroy are very, um, very much into getting the vaccine. I, I will say that uh, it still leaves about 10,000 uh, residents who are eligible to get the vaccine uh, still needing the vaccine. And uh, I'll just say that um, I know that that the uh, Johnson and Johnson has been uh, placed on pause and then unpaused, uh, and it will soon be available again. But uh, the other two vaccines are extremely, um, uh, extremely good at what they do as well, both the Moderna and the Pfizer, and those are uh, given at the Gilroy High School. Uh, just to uh, to make a plug for um, a couple of vaccine sites at Gilroy High School. Uh, uh, Tuesday through Friday from 8.30 to 3.30, you can make an appointment. And I'm hearing that the appointments are pretty uh, uh, pretty much available. And so, and so is the vaccine. Along with that, uh, at San Ysidro Park this coming Wednesday uh, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., uh, they'll be accepting uh, uh, any walk-ins. No appointment is necessary. So, Either locations, uh, people can get their vaccine and certainly their first dose of either the, the Pfizer or the Moderna. Uh, and in addition to that, the fire department continues to support and provide for um, vaccines for homebound uh, people, uh, people who are unable to make it to either of the vaccination sites and uh, will actually come out to your home. We've uh, to date have vaccinated about 47 people uh, I believe that we have another uh, five that, that we're going to be vaccinating uh, this week. Uh, they're not high numbers, I, I realize that, but they're the ones who are the most vulnerable. They have uh, typically uh, uh, several comorbid factors and uh, they have disabilities that prevent them from leaving their homes. So uh, we do come out and we encourage people to uh, contact uh, the county. They, they're actually the ones who are running the program and uh, we administer uh, to them. You can call the, uh, the 211 number or uh, there is another, um, uh, another number. I, I'm sorry, I don't have it uh, in front of me right at the moment, uh, but the county website uh, does have it. And uh, you can uh, contact on behalf of the, of the family member or loved one, or you can contact them yourself and see if you're eligible. And uh, I'm ready to take any questions you might have. Marie? Sorry, I muted because of the dog. Council Member Brocco. <laughs> uh, now that uh, the Johnson & Johnson is back available, do we have any plans to go out into the homeless encampments? Oh, uh, you know what? Uh, Targeting done, yeah. Yeah, Council Member, I, I appreciate you bringing that up and I, and I, uh, I was remiss that I didn't include that. Um, I did contact the county. Um, the uh, Santa Clara County uh, Valley Medical Center has a, uh, a, a special section uh, called the Valley Homeless Healthcare Program. I talked to their coordinator and uh, every single encampment, including uh, we're at the uh, Armory, uh, they have been out to and uh, they continually um, will go out to different locations as long as they know that they have five or more people We've been in contact with the um, Compassion Center and uh, uh, they are uh, spreading the word. So uh, if there is uh, a need to, um, 
to vaccinate more of the homeless. Uh, uh, the, uh, the Valley Homeless Healthcare Program will, will go out and do it. Um, they also have a, a subdivision uh, with that and they provide healthcare to uh, the homeless. And that was something I was unaware of. They call it the Backpack Homeless Healthcare Program. And they'll go into the creeks and uh, into the encampments and provide uh, just general uh, all around healthcare. And along with that, they'll bring the vaccine to, to the homeless. So they've been doing that several times. And I'll say even some of the, uh, uh, the streets in which we've seen numerous uh, RVs, they've, they've said they've already, um, they've already uh, hit that group as well or vaccinated that group as well. So um, again, if you have any, uh, any uh, groups of people that, uh, that you notice or see, um, just contact us and we'll get a hold of the, uh, uh, the coordinator and she'll send her group out there. Thanks, Chief. That's good news. Okay, thank you, Chief. I'd like to report too from our Saturday meetings with county that as of this last Saturday, uh, the countywide number for people having received their first dose was 68.9% as compared to Gilroy's 74.2%. So that is really, really, really good. Um, also, uh, things have flipped, whereas for the longest time, it was far more people wanting the vaccine than there were vaccines available, right? And, and almost, uh, you know, wishing that some people wouldn't, wouldn't fight, you know, so much like putting, like it was a competition to get vaccinated and, and, a, and who, who, who was more worthy of getting vaccinated first. It has now flipped and we have vaccines, more vaccines than people are scheduling appointments. So even though the percentages are good for people who have gotten appointments, there are vaccines now. So please, if you want a vaccine and, and haven't done so yet, make an appointment. Okay. All right. Uh, with that, we go to um, city attorney's re uh, report. Uh, there's no city attorney's report tonight. We do have a closed session, however. Shall I read it? Uh, yes, please. Uh, conference with labor negotiators, collective bargaining units, pursuant to Gilroy Code Section, excuse me, Government Code Section 54957.6 and Gilroy City Code Section 17A114. Collective bargaining units are AFSCME Local 101, representing employees affiliated with AFSCME Local 101. City negotiators, Jimmy Forbes, City Administrator, Leanne McPhillips, HR Director. Anticipated issues under negotiation are wages, hours, benefits, working conditions, memorandums of understanding, City of Gilroy, uh, and AFSCME Local 101, representing employees affiliated with AFSCME Local 101. So that, that's the name of the closed session. It's a labor closed session. So uh, I will be leaving, but when you go into closed session, you don't take a you don't take a vote now. But when you go into closed session, take a vote, and then keep track of that vote, and that's a reportable action. Okay, okay. thank you. You're First, welcome. though, I, I must now go to Christina and ask if there are any public comments on closed session items. Right. If you wish to speak on this item, please press star nine to unmute yourself or raise your hand. Seen and hearing none. Okay, then with that, I would like to adjourn to closed session. But again, we are adjourning in memory of Donald Elvis Prieto. Okay, so uh, go ahead and have everybody exit who needs to exit, and then we'll vote to 